Halifax Traffic, Atlantic Bear. When I say I work on boats, they're like, oh, you're a cook. No, no, I'm not a cook. I'm the engineer. And I've had men tell me, this is no place for a woman. Go home. Just down a little bit. That's perfect. I think it being a male-dominated industry makes women a little weary to apply. Yeah. <laughs> it is hard work, but, you know, we can handle it. Welcome to Land and Sea. I'm Tom Murphy. For centuries, Maritimers have made their living on the sea. And for much of that time, those working on the water were all men. In fact, some sailors considered it bad luck to even allow a woman on board a vessel. But while it is still very much a male-dominated industry, women have been slowly breaking down the barriers that for years kept them on land. As dawn slowly breaks, the crew of the tugboat, the Atlantic Bear, prepare for a busy day working Halifax Harbor. While the crew hauls the lines, down below the engines roar to life. First stop, getting an oil tanker called the East Coast off the docks on the Dartmouth side of the harbor. Atlantic Bear, East Coast Channel 7. East Coast, Atlantic Bear, you're loud and clear. Good morning, Dan. Hi, Andrea, good morning. Andrea McDonald is the tug's captain. We've got one at each end of the ship so that we can pull the ship out like pretty much parallel or turn it as necessary and uh, whatever the pilot wants us to do. But basically we're gonna haul her off the dock. Ships do really well going forward and backwards, but they don't go sideways very well. So that's what we're for. They need us for that. Bear back easy. Bear back easy. Okay, so now we are pulling him off. Even though McDonald grew up in a fishing community, she started her career in the insurance industry. Back then, women working at sea wasn't really a viable option. This was, this was a love that I had as, as a teenager, and I didn't realize that this is the path I should be going down. And back then, nobody ever said, hey, go work on a tugboat. That, was, that would have been unheard of in my family, even though I grew up on boats. Finally, in 2000, after spending a few weeks crewing a friend's schooner, McDonald decided to follow her heart. Finding a job was one thing, finding acceptance in a man's world was quite another. There were no other women on board in any capacity anywhere within the company that I first worked for. And there were challenges for sure. Some of the men were not so welcoming, they, they were not accepting of a woman being on board. I've had some times in my career where it was pretty bad and there have been times I really did think about just packing it in and saying that's it, I'm going back to insurance or I'm going to just go do something else. But you know what, every job has challenging times. McDonald will be the first to tell you times have changed. There are more women working at sea now. In fact, a couple of years ago, she captained the first all-female tugboat crew in Halifax Harbor. Kelsey McLean is the tug's chief engineer. My job as an engineer is to fix everything that breaks. If we have a problem with main engines or propulsion systems or a piece of critical equipment, my job is to get it back online as fast as possible, figure out why it did what it did, prevent it from happening ever again, and keep everything going. Even with attitudes about women at sea changing, Kelsey knew she was entering a field still dominated by men. It doesn't bug me at all. It actually gives me a little bit more of a challenge. Once I started working here and working on the engine room, being a female and being small like I am, I basically had to prove myself. So I worked my butt off to get where I am now. And all the guys around here respect me for that. Respected and accepted at work, Kelsey still encounters gender bias when she tells people about her job. When I say I work on boats, they're like, oh, you're a cook. No, no, I'm not a cook. I'm the engineer. <laughs> I'm the one that fixes everything that breaks. I'm the one getting my hands dirty. Life on board a tug can be tough. They work in all kinds of weather at all hours of the day and night, 365 days a year. 
It's challenging and potentially dangerous. This tug is, is 6,000 horsepower. She pulls with 72 tons of force. And that's all on that line if we give her full power, right? So things can break. It's a job that is also physically demanding, especially for deckhands like Jocelyn Smith and Anita Duguay. My theory is just as long as the job gets done, like I might not be as strong as someone standing next to me, but if I can get it done a different way, that, that's all that really matters. And I mean, there are some guys that I'm stronger than, but there are some guys that are stronger than me, so it doesn't really matter as long as you get it done at the end of the day. This is a busy day in the harbor. NATO warships here on exercises join the container ships, cruise lines, and tankers calling at port. Bear, square up, stand by the back. Uh, bear, square up, stand by the back. Do I have room to square up, you guys? Square up? No. Bear, are you ready to back? Yep, I can back. Bear, back a third. Bear, back a third. Somebody want to have a quick little just jaunt out onto the deck, please, and, and make sure that I can nose up on this thing without wrecking their rails? This is a real tight little space. Every day, every ship brings a new challenge. Okay. Everyone has to pull their weight to get the job done. Let me know when I'm getting close. Get closer and closer. You're probably okay. going to an angle. Okay. Even though these women made history when they first worked together, the reality is women are still grossly underrepresented in the industry. And while choosing a life at sea may still be a bit daunting for some women, for this crew, it was the right choice. Come back now. Most days, I absolutely love it. Something new every day. I like figuring out problems. I love working with my hands. I don't mind getting dirty. That's half the fun of the job. And just living on board, not having to drive to work every day, you just roll out of the bunk and go get your coffee and go, huh? Yeah, hello, good morning. <laughs> I'm at work. <laughs> I don't really think of myself as one woman amongst a gun bunch of guys. I just kind of think of us all, you know, part of the crew, getting the, getting the job done. Attitudes towards women on board are changing. This is a fantastic job. You know, like, we have great work-life balance. We earn a good salary. We have an awful lot of fun. Um, we live on these boats. The people that we work with are like a second family to us, and I really like that. This is our home when we're not, you know, when, when we're not at home. Coming up. I think it would be a great Hollywood movie for somebody. It would be an incredible story. It really would. The remarkable woman who changed the law and attitudes, charting the course for future generations of women at sea. Nestled on the shores of the Bay of Fundy, the village of Alma, New Brunswick, is the gateway to the Bay of Fundy National Park. Down at the wharf, the local lobster fleet gets ready for another season. The crews on these boats are all men, but the town's most famous seafarer was a woman. Molly Cool, the first female sea captain in North America, and she was born in Alma, grew up in Alma. Molly Cool was born in 1916. Her father, Paul, was a Dutch immigrant who moved to Alma to work in the lumber industry, building a scow to move the cargo along the Bay of Fundy. Don McLean is a historian with the Albert County Museum. In those days, the mode of transportation was by water, and lumbering was very important. Uh, in the wintertime, the men would go to the winter logging camps, and then in the spring, there'd be the drive and so on. And so there's a lot of shipping of lumber. The scows were a very efficient, they weren't a sailing ship, a beautiful sailing ship, they were a working ship. Back then, the crews were all men, but with the Depression looming, Paul Cool turned to his daughter, a decision that would shape history. Times were hard. Everyone worked really hard. And so her dad needed help on his scow. And so it was inevitable. But she knew it well. She had been trained very well from being knee high. Uh, there's a story that when she was out on the scow, she even had to have a box so she could stand up to even be able to control the wheel. She knew how to do everything. She knew how to repair those engines. She knew how to, whatever needed to be done. In those days, a woman working the Bay of Fundy was a rarity. 
but in an interview with the CBC in 2000, Molly Cool said she felt she was accepted. I don't really know what they thought, but, but they all respected me, or at least I think they did. None of them were mean to me. There was no money for me to go to school. It was the only life I knew. I, I, I felt I was just as good as anybody else was at it. And she proved it. In 1937, she became the first woman to attend the Merchant Marine School in St. John. Two years after earning her mate's ticket, Cool traveled to Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, passing the exam to become the first female captain in North America. But only after forcing a change in the law. She was grilled for two days on everything, everything. But she passed with flying colors. But they still wouldn't uh, accept her application because the Shipping Act said he. There was no room for the pronoun she in the Shipping Act. So, but inevitably, they had to overturn that. And so she actually brought about the change in the Shipping Act so that now it could be a he or a she. When I passed, I, I wired my older sister, call me captain from now on. But captaining a vessel in the notorious waters of the Bay of Fundy was no easy task, especially in the days before GPS and satellite technology. You're talking close to 50 foot tides, the highest tides in the world, extremely thick fog, icy cold water, unpredictable weather. And, you know, she did this back in the 1930s and 40s and times when none of that technology was available. And she used her natural instincts. Darren Bavis has sailed the Bay of Fundy for years. All right, so these are some pictures from the day that she came aboard our schooner. Bavis met Cool when he invited her for the inaugural sail of his schooner, the Molly Cool. Even though she was long retired, Cool couldn't resist taking command. We had some problems with getting sails down at that point, and she knew what to do, but I didn't know what to do. So she bit her lip and stayed quiet for as long as she could. And then finally she just bursted out and told me what to do. And it became quite funny because she was like, you know, she, she didn't want to be the captain on board that day, but she ended up being the captain in the end. Cool left the sea in 1944 after meeting her husband and moving to Maine. But she never lost her love of Alma and the Bay of Fundy. You know, when uh, Molly used to uh, visit us, she would sit on this bench for hours looking out at the, uh, at the Bay of Fundy, uh, reminiscing, uh, I suppose, of her old days. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. She was spent hours here. Ken Kelly is a longtime family friend. Molly was an exciting lady. She was both dignified and she could uh, speak the, uh, the sailor jargon at times when you talk to her personally. Uh, uh, she was quite a lady. When Molly Cool died in 2009, she left instructions to have her ashes spread in the Bay of Fundy. She actually uh, even selected the, the boat and the captain that would, would do it for her. Oh, it was very emotional, very important. This was her place. The Bay of Fundy was hers. The community of Alma is working hard to preserve Cool's legacy, erecting a monument on the waterfront her captain's license etched in stone, and turning her family home into an interpretive center at the entrance of the National Park. But many here believe Cool deserves more. I'm surprised at how few Canadians know about her. Right? Even New Brunswickers and people from around here, there's a lot of people who have no idea who she is. I just feel that it's massive what she's done. I think it would be a great movie, you know, a Hollywood movie for somebody. It may not be a Hollywood movie, but last spring, the Canadian Coast Guard celebrated her place in seafaring history by naming its newest icebreaker the Molly Cool at a ceremony attended by her youngest sister, Martha. I feel it's wonderful that it's the icebreaker that's being named after her because when she was going to sea, she did everything. It didn't matter what it was, she did it. She would been thrown to death. You just can't imagine how, how much it means to all of us. 80 years ago, a, a girl from a small little village 
and she had this goal she was going to receive her Master Mariners, and she did, and she didn't stop until she did. And so that's the message to young women, or any woman today, that if you have the desire to do something, it's in your heart, you have the passion, you know you can do it, then you go for it. Coming up, recruiting the next generation of women at sea. I think that is the hardest part, is making the initial decision to apply and jump in feet first and go for it. On a windy fall day on the Strait of Canso, the wharf at Port Hawkesbury is abuzz with activity. While locals reel in a late season run of mackerel, students from the Nova Scotia Nautical Institute get their first taste of a sailor's worst nightmare, abandoning ship at sea. So normally, this is where we'd muster if we received the abandoned ship alarm, which would be three prolonged blast. Darlene Sutherland is one of three women in the deckhand course, a lobster fisherman, the only one with experience at sea. A lot of, you know, I'll say the older, the older guys didn't like women being on the boat, superstitions, couldn't, didn't think they could do the work, etc. But it's not all that hard. Like, it is hard work, but, you know, we can handle it. Okay, so we're gonna board the craft one at a time. In this disaster exercise, Sutherland and her classmates are about to learn what it's like to be thrown 40 feet into the sea in a free fall lifeboat. Right, everybody's on board. We're gonna check your seat belts and go through the launching procedures. The students strap in looking a bit like astronauts about to blast off into space. Are we clear to launch? Right, you're uh, safe on your to go. Okay, cross your arms, head back in the seat, stay loose in your seat. Here we go. <laughs> On the same wharf, other students launch a more traditional lifeboat. Out in the strait, they practice another nightmare scenario, rescuing a person overboard. Each student takes a turn driving while another tries to snag the life ring. For Bree Reed, it was her first time in a lifeboat. It's very wobbly. It's, it's a lot different than a car, that's for sure. It's a little stressful. It's new to all of, well, most of us now anyway, but it's, it is stressful, but it's pretty calm today anyway, so it wasn't, I can only imagine how crazy it really would be, or would get. They're gonna lower that down and actually try to put the fire out with it. Back on land, the students get even more disaster training. Water up. Learning what to do if a fire breaks out on board ship. It takes teamwork. Both Reed and Callie Sampson admit that as women, there is the added pressure of proving they can handle the job as well as any man. You do feel the pressure. I don't think the pressure really goes away, but so far we've been doing just fine uh, with the guys, with the other girl. Yeah, it's been good so far. It's intimidating, but it's, it's worth it. And it pushes you to do better, to do more, to do something better than them, but at the end of the day, I mean, we're all equal, so that's how I look at it. But convincing women to consider a career at sea isn't easy. Over the years, the Nautical Institute has had a hard time attracting women. Since I've been here, I would say it's been much less than 10% every year. There'll be one or none or two in each class. So maybe there'll be two or three start in engineering and one or two start in navigation. Longtime instructor Cynthia Brown says the school is working hard to recruit more young women into the industry. It's kind of a tide rises all ships thing. So we do high school visits to get young people thinking about uh, that there's possibilities of a career at sea. We have one of our banners that we use for advertising says Nova Scotians have gone to sea for generations, join the next wave. And so that's kind of what we're, we're trying to just encourage it as a, as a viable career option for anyone. Part of the difficulty attracting women is the lack of role models. Are we using the hacksaw or the chop saw? Hacksaw. It's something Tiffany O'Donnell noticed as a child when her father was in the Coast Guard. Even when I was like five, six, seven years old, like when my mom would take me and my brothers to go pick my dad up from work, I remember seeing all the workers there and just thinking to myself, there's no women here. And that was about 20 years ago, so I know times have changed a little bit, but even for a child to notice that really says something. And times are changing. 
With strong recruitment efforts and a new program offering substantial scholarships for women and indigenous groups, the institute has seen a big increase in the number of female students. The first one's hard, eh? O'Donnell is one of several women training to be marine engineers. Just being able to be kind of the jack of all trades kind of person, there's just so many different parts to it that really interest me. It, it seems like there's always something new to do and every, every day is a different day. When O'Donnell and her classmates graduate, there should be no shortage of jobs. The industry is desperate for workers, especially women. I know there definitely is a change and I mean hopefully someday we won't have to have this conversation and then it'll just be people going to work, doing the job and loving the sea. Halifax traffic, Atlantic Bear. Great, this is Halifax traffic up. Andrea McDonald has seen a lot of changes through her long career and even though she has experienced a few rough seas, there is no place she would rather be. This job, you know, it gives a lot of satisfaction when the ships are all in and everybody's here and tied up and secured. We head her on back to the dock. It's a good feeling. And it's not the kind of feeling you get working in an office, I found. Like, this is hands-on and we make a difference here in the harbor. And I really like that. Halifax traffic, Atlantic Bear. We're all finished with the Jennifer Shepherds at Pier 41. We're heading back to IEL dock.